Hello everyone and uh, welcome to this lecture. Uh, we are going to carry on and uh, look more closely at this uh, functions or sums of independent uh, random variables. Uh, this is part 2 of this lecture. In the previous lecture we saw how uh, this weak law of large numbers kicked in and uh, using some simple Chebyshev inequality uh, we could come up with some nice bounds for sample mean and we had some comparisons and we looked at how a larger number of samples means uh, something better about the properties of samples that we get from IID, IID I mean, properties of the distribution that we derive from IID, IID samples, something becomes better about them as you get more and more samples. Right? So there was some uh, theme to those kind of ideas. We will build on those ideas in this lecture. Okay? So we will see more sharper results. Uh, there are two particular results that we will see. One is uh, what is called the concentration phenomenon. And I mentioned how the Chebyshev result is weak and could be tightened. Uh, we will do something called concentration to do that. It will be a quick result. And the next result we will see is something called the central limit theorem. Okay? So it is a very celebrated result. In both of these, uh, we will do some uh, in reasonable detail uh, in the next uh, few lectures. Okay? So let us get started. The uh, first thing we will do is this concentration phenomenon. Uh, so, uh, so, so, so the basic idea behind uh, looking at concentration or anything like that is to try and bound this probability that the sample mean deviates from the distribution mean by more than some t. Okay? So this is sort of like the central idea behind what is this, what is called this concentration phenomenon. Okay? So let us see once again what this uh, main issue is, main setting is. The setting is you have n IID samples from a certain distribution x. Okay? So this is a usual setting. And then we define our sample mean which is x1 plus x2 plus xn divided by n. Okay? I am going to divide by n here for now. Uh, we have seen this Chebyshev bound before which says the probability that the sample mean deviates by more than delta from the distribution mean mu. Right? So the distribution x itself says so mu is the expected value of x. Okay? So I guess that is clear from the context but anyway nevertheless let me just write it down once again for you. Mu is expected value of x and sigma square is variance of x and we will assume both of these are finite in these kind of examples. Okay? So, the probability that the sample mean deviates by more than delta from the distribution mean is bounded by 1 by n. Okay? So, there is sigma square by delta square, but it is bounded by 1 by n. And this was enough to show the fantastic weak law of large numbers which said x bar generally gets very, very close to mu. It is almost indistinguishable from mu as we make n very, very, very large. Okay? So, that was the result of weak law of large numbers. Okay? So, but uh, let us see how weak uh, this uh, Chebyshev uh, inequality is. We will take uh, x to be Bernoulli half which has mu as 0.5 and uh, sigma square as 0.25, right? So, Bernoulli half is just uh, 0, so 0, 1 taken with probability half, half, okay? Expected value of x is half, expected value of x squared is also half, right? So, the mean and variance will turn out to be 0 0.5 and 0 0.25. Okay? So, you can do this calculation, it is not very hard. Okay? So, now for n equals 10, one can do this calculation, the probability of x bar minus 0 0.5 is greater than 0 0.3. Okay? So, how do you do this uh, kind of calculation? So, let us let's look at x bar. So, when let us look at x1 plus xn, this I know is binomial n comma half, right? So, if I put n equals 10 here, uh, this probability of, uh, so if you look at n equals 10, probability that uh, mod x bar minus half is greater than 0.3 is actually the same as probability that x1, so instead of x bar, I can put x1 plus xn divided by n, that x10, right? So, uh, there is a divided by 10 here, so that needs to multiply. So, so, this would be the same as probability that, uh, so maybe I should write it a little bit more to the left, probability that x1 plus so on till x10, you can put a range uh, for this, right? So, okay, so maybe I should write it down a bit differently. There are two ranges here. So, x1 plus x10 could be, you know, for x bar minus half to be greater than 0 0.3, x1 plus x10 could be greater than 8 or x1 plus x10 has to be less than 2, right? Okay? So, check this out. 
this should be correct. So, this is the probability that a binomial 10 comma half right this is binomial 10 comma half right these two are binomial 10 comma half and what is the probability that it is either greater than 8 or less than 2. So, I can do an exact computation and that is what I have done here to get 0.0215 okay and you can also plug in the Chebyshev inequality right put sigma square is 0.25 uh, delta square will become you know 0.3 squared n is 10 and look at the number you get you get 0.278 okay it is an order of magnitude off okay the actual probability is 0 0.0215 and the upper bound is 0 0.278 okay what is worse is as n increases n goes to 50 the same probability probability of x bar minus 0 0.5 is greater than 0 0.3 now remember n has gone to 50 right so if n has gone to 50 so when n is 50 the same uh, probability will work out as probability that x1 plus x50 is greater than right uh, 50 25 uh, 15 so it's greater than 40 or x1 plus x50 is less than 10 right so this is the probability here okay this also can be evaluated you can put it into a computer program you can take your python notebook uh, look at the cdf of binomial etc so this is binomial 50 comma half right so that is probability and look at the number here it is 5.61 into 10 power minus 6 it goes so small so it drops dramatically right from n equal to 10 to n equal to 50 the probability that the sample mean deviates from 0 0.5 by more than 0 0.3 falls dramatically here but notice how I mean the Chebyshev bound is also falling so this is Chebyshev bound this is Chebyshev it is also falling but it is not falling so much I mean when it goes 5 times it is falling only divided by 5 right so that is what you expect it is this 1 by n uh, behavior while this seems to show a very huge fall an exponential fall behavior the actual probability is falling very very sharply while the Chebyshev bound is not keeping up okay. So the Chebyshev bound is weak for this reason you, you can repeat this experiment with other parameters other distributions you will see the Chebyshev bound is uh, predicting something weak here. Okay. So, Chebyshev bound falls as 1 by n. Okay. In many cases, the actual probability will fall as some e power minus constant into n. Okay. So, it will be like that and you may remember from your maths 1 lectures when you look at the function 1 by x and e power minus x, you know we have done some comparisons long long back and how 1 by n is really really slow and e power minus cn will suddenly sharply drop and uh, it'll, then 1 by n can never keep up with that. Okay. So, exponential fall with n is much much faster and it looks like if we do a bit more work we can improve on the Chebyshev bound right. So, we should be able to get uh, better bounds some exponential bounds uh, maybe are possible at least for the binomial case it looks very much possible and that is uh, sort of like the concentration phenomenon right. So, how do we improve these kind of bounds Chebyshev is already a bit of a concentration result but you know can we get uh, better bounds is one uh, line of study in probability and uh, that is called concentration. So, let us see one uh, very interesting way in which you can make this better. Okay. So, now uh, this title is, uh, is this Markov, Chebyshev and Chernoff and you see a lot of uh, Russian names involved it is like this Russian mafia is against you you know, uh, I know I know how you feel I think the, the name itself strikes some fear you feel like somebody is going to gun you down. Uh, it is actually not that difficult we have already seen Markov and Chebyshev it is actually the same thing right. So, the same Markov you use with some small modification to get the Chebyshev inequality right. So, I am trying to just drive home that point here uh, Markov inequality applies for a random variable that takes positive values and it gives you that bound right probability that x is greater than t is less than or equal to expected value of x divided by t. Now, for a arbitrary random variable how do we apply Markov we do not apply directly we take this function x minus e of x and then take its absolute value or you know you can think of squaring that value. So, now x minus e of x squared will take only positive values right. So, probability that x minus e of x squared is greater than t squared is now less than or equal to variance of x divided by t squared right. So, how did I get variance of x? So, this is just you know this is same as this is just Markov okay. So, this guy is expected value of x minus e of x whole square. Okay, it is the same Markov applied in a slightly different way gives you Chebyshev okay. So, it is not that uh, difficult but except you know people have this fear when they see these names and they already conclude that they cannot understand so they do not spend that time it is look at it very carefully 
it is actually quite a easy application. Now, squaring is not the only way to get positive uh, values, right? You can use other functions, okay? So, you, you took a random variable x, we did x minus e of x whole squared. Can we do something else? Can we do some other function uh, like the exponential function? We know that e power x is always also non-negative, right? You remember the plot of e power x, it is always non-negative, it goes positive. So, can we use uh, e power x, okay, instead of squaring? Okay, squaring is good, but can we use e power x uh, to get uh, positive values? And then what happens? That gives you Chernoff method, Chernoff method, Chernoff inequality. Uh, so, here we will restrict, uh, we will restrict uh, x such that expected value of x is equal to 0, okay? Now, this is not a very serious restriction. If you remember one of my earlier lectures, I told you how if, if you have an arbitrary random variable, you can always centralize it, right? So, sort of make, make its mean 0. You can translate it to make its mean 0. How will you do it? Instead of x, you look at x minus e of x, right? x minus e of x always has mean 0. So, you can do that. So, this is not a serious restriction, restricting x to expected value of x equal to 0. You simply translate to make it 0, okay? So, then uh, I can simply look at x greater than t because I know x expected value is 0, right? So, x minus e of x is not needed. Now, uh, I will pick a lambda which is positive, okay? Some lambda, it could be 1, 2, 3, 4, I mean you can think of it as 1 if, if it is confusing you, uh, but some lambda you can pick and then use the function e power lambda x on this inequality, okay? So, if x is greater than t, that is the same as e power lambda x being greater than e power lambda t, okay? So, previously we squared both sides to get the positive uh, random variable. Now, instead of squaring, we will do this e power lambda x, okay? On both sides, we do e power lambda x. Now, once you do e power lambda x, this becomes uh, non-negative, takes only positive values, right? Why is that? Because e power lambda x is non-negative. It does not go to less than 0 at all, right? So, now we use Markov. So, notice how we go back and back and back once again to Markov. Markov is really the only inequality. You transform the random variable using these, you know, non-negative functions like squaring or, uh, you know, raising it to exponentiation e power lambda x and then you again use Markov this is less than or equal to expected value of this e power lambda x, okay? Now, previously we had variance being the expected value here. So, Chebyshev came in terms of that. Now, we have this other quantity, e expected value of e power lambda x. So, this seems to be a naturally interesting quantity in these kind of settings and you divide it by e power lambda t, okay? So, there is this lambda floating around. You might think, why should this lambda be there, okay? So, why can't I just set lambda to be equal to 1? So, it turns out you have something to gain by have keeping that lambda there. Okay, so, we will see that later. So, it is fine, right? Any any function which is uh, non-negative, I can use. E power lambda x is perfectly fine. It is such a non-negative function. So, I can use it, okay? So, so I have put lambda greater than 0 here. Uh, so we will we'll come back and revisit that range later, okay? So, this is the central idea behind this Chernoff inequality, okay? Once you have a Chernoff inequality, you see that this variance, like this variance, this expected value of E power lambda x uh, also, you know, expected value of x is 0 there, right? So, that also keep that in mind. Uh, it seems to play a central role. In fact, it has a name. Uh, this function is called the moment generating function of x, okay, MGF of x, okay? It is a very popular abbreviation. It is a very powerful, useful quantity. I hope to show you how uh, this is very useful as we study central limit theorem and all that. This will come up again and again. And you can see the natural way in, its, in which it is showing up, right? It, it shows up in this uh, bounding off a uh, deviation of x from its mean. Okay, so that's a good thing to know. So, so that's the MGF. And how do you pick lambda? You pick lambda to get the best possible upper bound, okay, or the least possible upper bound. Okay, so for every value of lambda, you will get different and different upper bounds. You minimize that over lambda. Okay, so you will see we'll we'll do that uh, to get the best possible upper bound. Okay, now uh, if you remember from your calculations, finding expected value, finding variance, and all involves a lot of computation with a random variable. Now, look at this expectation. It is already expected value of e power lambda x, okay? You can expect some very unwieldy expressions to show up when you when you do uh, e power lambda x, okay? A lot of trick is in simplifying those expressions. And one very standard way of simplifying that expression is to use an upper bound instead of the exact expression. You will see this is a very powerful method again uh, that is used to simplify our work, okay? So, the next few slides are going to be a bit uh, dense in terms of uh, the mathematical methods used, but I will urge you to just stay with me 
uh, don't worry too much if you don't understand every step of the mechanics and the mathematics that's going on. But finally, we'll get to a result and that result you have to sort of appreciate and understand. Okay, so stay with me and uh, when it comes to the result, I will pause and point out the important things about the result. Okay, so let's go ahead. Okay, so let me begin by uh, an example. Okay, so we saw the MGF and the bound and everything that's coming. Let's see an example to make our ideas clear. Okay, first is this centralizing. Okay, so supposing you have a ran random variable x with some mean e of x, how do I make the mean zero? So instead of x, you consider x minus e of x. Okay, it's just a translated version of x. It has most of the distribution properties intact. So you translate and you get a mean zero. Now this is a very important idea even when you do data science, right? When some data set is given to you, you want to analyze how it looks. One of the standard things people do is to first centralize it, okay? Make its mean zero because you don't want to be distracted by its mean, right? You know the mean can be anywhere. You pull it down to zero and then see the distribution around zero, okay? So that's a very powerful idea. It's used quite popularly in uh, when you handle data also, okay? So let's look at centralized Bernoulli halves. Now Bernoulli half is 0, 1 with probability half each. Its mean is a half. Now when you centralize, I'm going to take Bernoulli and subtract a half from it, okay? So x is going to be centralized Bernoulli half if it is minus half and half with probability half each, right? So this has got mean 0. Very simple, right? Nothing to be worried about. Uh, the Russian mafia is not yet involved, but still it's, it's, it's an easy enough uh, 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 exercise to do this centralization, okay? So now we're ready to calculate the moment generating function of the centralized Bernoulli random variable, right? Expected value of e power lambda x is just a function of x. There's nothing to be alarmed about it as far as the definition is concerned. How do you find expected value for the centralized Bernoulli? Probability that x equals minus half times e power minus lambda into half, right? Min lambda into minus half plus probability that x equals half e power lambda by 2. You just put x equals half, x equals minus half, substitute the probability, the standard way in which you compute expectation of any function, right? Expected value of g of x, right? We've seen that before. Just summation over probability that x takes a particular value, evaluate g at that value. That's it. That's all I've done here. It uh, comes down because these two probabilities are a half each, it works out to this function, e power lambda by 2 plus e power minus lambda by 2, the whole thing divided by 2. Okay, you can plot this function. You can see that this function has a interesting like U type shape and all that. You can try to plot it. We've done these kind of plots in your math course, right? Go back and remember what you did, how to plot these kind of functions. But you know, this is still a bit unwieldy. And uh, what one can do is this very interesting bound. There is this very interesting bound on this function. Uh, we're not going to see proofs of this bound, but uh, you can plot these two things and see how one is above the other, okay? Uh, I've, I've introduced you, I've spoken about Desmos uh, being a good plotting engine. There are other plotting engines available, your Python notebook, you can use for plotting if you like, but plot it. Just, just take a look at it, plot it and see, convince yourself that this bound is true, okay? So here is a bound. So you see that the moment generating function for the centralized Bernoulli has a very simple and nice upper bound e power lambda squared by 4, okay? Keep that in mind, that will come back and help us as we study more and more things, okay? Simple example. You see how uh, this ties in with the uh, previous uh, results that we saw, okay? So this gives us some hope of being able to use Chernoff bound with uh, Bernoulli random variables, okay? So now, another wonderful, wonderful property of the moment generating function is it plays very well with addition of independent random variables, okay? So you see the MGF is e power lambda x, right? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take x1 to xn being IID samples distributed according to the distribution of x, okay? And then I'm going to define the sum of these random variables. I'll call it S, uh, x1 plus dot 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 till xn, and then ask the question, what is the moment generating function of S, okay? So you might say, why is this important? Why do I need to care about the MGF of the sum? So it turns out, if you remember, when we look at sample mean and all that, we are worried about how the sum deviates from uh, its mean, right? So that's something we are worried about. So it's good to know the moment generating function because we know moment generating function gives us bounds on uh, deviation of the random variable from its mean. So the moment generating function is good. Now it turns out summing of independent random variables and moment generating functions were made for each other, okay? So they work so well together and you can see why it's, it's not very hard to see. If you do expected value of e power lambda s, you're going to get the product. 
e power lambda x1 times e power lambda x2 times so on till e power lambda x uh, lambda xn. Why? Because instead of s you put x1 plus x2 and then you will get e power lambda x1 plus lambda 2 x2 lambda x2 etc. And then you can just multiply it and write it as a product. Now this is expected value of a product of independent random variables that becomes equal to the product of the individual expected values, right. So this expected value uh, can be interchanged if the random variables are independent. If they are not independent, you can't do it. If they are independent, like in this case, you can push the expected value inside. Now that's one thing, expected value of lambda x1 dot 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 expected value of lambda x. And this itself is very nice, but notice another thing, all these xi's are identically distributed. So each of these e power lambda x1's is the same as the expected value of e power lambda x, okay. As a function of lambda, it's just the same thing. It doesn't, nothing changes because you put x1 or x2 because all of them have the identical distribution. So e, expected value of e power lambda s, the sum of iid random variables is simply the individual mgf of the distribution x raised to the power n, okay. Very, very simple and tidy result about the mgf. So the mgf multiplies when you add independent random variables, okay. Very useful and simple and elegant result and you see how the MGF is so powerful and why it naturally enters the picture when we study uh, samples and IID samples in particular. Okay. Wonderful, powerful result. Uh, let us see, let us use it and see how it happens, okay. Let us take the sum of centralized Bernoulli random variables. We have already seen uh, if x were to have a centralized Bernoulli distribution minus half, half with probability half each and if you take IID samples according to x, the distribution being according to x as in IID centralized Bernoulli samples and if I do sum of x1 through xn, I can now write down expected value of e power lambda s. It is exactly going to be e power lambda by 2 plus e power minus lambda by 2 by 2 the whole power n. Now you see the comfort of the upper bound, right? See previously if, if, you, if you just have to take the summation here and raise it to the power n, you will get so many terms in the expression. But once you put a bound of e power lambda squared by 4, you see the exponentiation by n simply gives you e power n lambda squared by 4. Look at the powerful way in which things are bound and uh, the bound works so cleanly with the MGF, okay. So this bound is really, really useful. Uh, we will use it in our next step and we will see this, this kind of an expression of being able to bound an exponential, uh, sum of exponentials raised to the power n is very central in the concentration phenomenon approach, okay. Now we are ready to see the Chernoff bound. The idea, you remember the idea, right? It is just Markov inequality applied to e power lambda x, right? e power lambda x and e power lambda t and we had the MGF show up and once you have a good MGF, you have a good Chernoff bound, okay? And that is what we are going to see for the binomial, okay? So I will start with x1, xn being centralized Bernoulli and I will look at the sum x1 plus uh, so on till xn, okay? Now uh, probability, this is Chernoff, right? So this is Chernoff bound. This is the basic Chernoff method, okay. Probability that s is greater than t is less than or equal to the moment generating function of s divided by e power lambda t. Now what do I know? I know a bound for the moment generating function of e power of s, okay. Expected value of e power lambda s is less than or equal to e power n lambda squared by 4 minus lambda t. Look at how neat this expression is, okay. So I am able to upper bound the uh, the probability that the sum deviates by t by an exponential, okay. So that's what I wanted, right. I, had, I thought Chebyshev was not that good, it was going 1 by n, my actual probability is going exponentially down, can I get an exponential bound and here is an exponential bound. The only thing that's left here is how do I choose lambda, okay. Now how do I choose lambda, you've seen all this before, it's not very hard, right. Remember this, this is e power, What what type of a function is this? in the exponent, it is a quadratic function, is not it? We have seen all this before except that you might have forgotten, that is done in math 1, I wrote the exam, I can forget about it, no, no, math 1 is very important, it will come throughout your life, okay. So this is uh, quadratic in lambda, okay. So now I am saying probability of, probability of s greater than t is less than or equal to something. I want to pick lambda to have the lowest possible bound, okay, and I have e power something. Now to minimize e power something, what should I do? I should minimize that something, right? e power is just an increasing function. To minimize e power uh, something, 
I have to minimize whatever is there in that exponent, okay. So now what is there in that exponent? It is a quadratic function of lambda and you know how to minimize quadratic functions, right? You have plotted quadratic functions and you go through and find the lambda and that is exactly what you have to do here. You have to find that value of lambda which will minimize this quadratic and it is easy enough to do. It turns out 2t by n is that best possible value of lambda. You plug it in here, you will get this fantastic, fantastic little bound and look at how very neatly uh, it is getting expressed as uh, in terms of n and there is an exponential involved probability that s is greater than t is less than or equal to e power minus t squared by n, okay. So now let us see how to compare it with uh, uh, Chebyshev and all that. So I have to go back to Bernoulli, okay. So remember the one difference is I am in centralized Bernoulli. I centralized it for convenience because I did not want to deal with that uh, non-zero mean and all that. But now I have to go back to that non-zero mean so that we can actually compare the binomial, right. Now uh, instead of x1, if I add a half to x1, I get the Bernoulli, right. y1 equals x1 plus half is Bernoulli. Now uh, actually I want sum of Bernoulli so that I get binomial, right. So I want y1 plus y2 plus so on till yn, I will call it y, but that is the same as s plus n by 2, is not it? It is the same as s plus n by 2 and that becomes binomial n comma half, okay. So now if I want my binomial to be greater than n by 2 by uh, some delta times n by 2, this is the expression, right. I want probability that y, so this is... Uh, this is expected value of y, this is uh, you know delta times expected value of y, okay. So I want my y binomial to be away by from expected value of y by uh, delta by 2 times n. So this is what we have seen before, right. So this is the same as, so you would normally divide this by the, by n, right. So, so if you see this, this is the same as in case you are wondering where I am coming from, this y by n if you take. Uh, y by n, this maybe you can move to this side, minus half is greater than half into delta, okay. So this is what I am seeing here, this is the same as what we had before, okay. So probability that the sample mean of the Bernoulli, I mean Bernoulli samples or binomial and a variable divided by n, minus half which is the actual distribution mean is greater than some something, okay, deviates by something. So that is the same as probability that s is greater than n delta by 2. Why? Because y minus n by 2 is the same as s, okay. So it is just a simple manipulation and now I can just plug in, okay. I know, I know this uh, Chernoff inequality is here, okay. I have to just use that here. I put t equals n delta by 2, you will get what I want, okay. So notice this wonderful bound here, probability that y goes above its mean by n delta by 2 is exponentially bounded in n. It is less than or equal to e power minus n uh, delta square by 4, okay. So that is an improvement over the Chebyshev inequality. Compare with Chebyshev, y greater than n by 2 plus n delta by 2 is less than or equal to 1 by n uh, delta squared, okay. So of course, uh, Chebyshev has the absolute value. It does both sides. This is only one side. I mean, that will only differentiate by half or something. So it is okay. This is a uh, good enough uh, bound, okay. So notice the comparison, this goes 1 by n, that goes e power minus n, okay, which is what we wanted, right. So once again, uh, if you did not follow every step in the mathematical derivation, it is okay. But the point is, Chebyshev inequality told you that the sample mean does not deviate too much from the distribution mean. It deviates uh, too much, the probability falls by 1 by n. In fact, some simple derivations for the binomial distribution, this is for the binomial distribution, it shows us that uh, exponential uh, probability bounding is possible. So this is the so-called concentration phenomenon. Uh, you can use it for a specific distribution when you know the distribution very well or you know the class of distributions very well, you can use this behavior and uh, really you know the sample mean, the fact that it deviates from it, the distribution mean is going to fall very sharply, that is the, that's the moral of the story. Okay, let us uh, compare Chebyshev and uh, Chernoff for a binomial distribution. I have gone n equals 10, 50, 100, 200, 400. You can see, look at the last column. Last column, the actual probability goes as 10 power minus 36 and all that. Uh, Chebyshev is like 0 0.007 and look at uh, e power n delta square. It is not quite close, but at least it is giving you the correct set of behavior. It says, it says that the fall is uh, exponential, 
Okay, so this sort of convinces you that uh, the Chernoff bound is so much better than the Chebyshev bound. Okay, so one by n versus uh, e power minus c n, you see the big difference. Okay, so once the model of the story here is uh, the concentration around for the sample mean uh, being close to the distribution mean is, is really really high. Mostly, it's going to be around the distribution mean, but it can deviate a little bit, but not too much. When you have 400 samples, 800 samples, and all that, it's going to be really 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 close. But when you have 100 samples, even 50 samples, you can see some differences. But as you keep increasing the samples, you will not see too much of a difference. Okay, so that's the model of the story. Okay, so I want to make a few remarks on this concentration phenomenon. It's it's usually considered a slightly advanced subject, uh, mostly in basic courses people don't see it. But I think you should should sort of know about this result because there's, there's lots of philosophy and importance here for what this means. Okay, so let's start with uh, what the setting is. The setting is you have n iid samples according to a distribution x, and you're looking at the sum of these n iid random variables. The concentration uh, phenomenon generally proceeds as follows. You, you try and get exponential bounds for probability that y deviates from its expo expected value beyond t. Okay? I, I, I see, in some sense, I am expecting my y to be close to its expected value, to be concentrated around its expected value. I am not expecting y to take values too much of the expected value of y. When, when y is summed up like this with IID samples. So I can get sharp bounds and one of the methods, very powerful methods in uh, concentration phenomenon is to look at uh, e power lambda y and uh, use the Chernoff method for bounding. It, it's always a starting point and people use very clever bounding methods to get better and better results. Okay, So this is very important to know. So we saw this when x is Bernoulli, you may say what if x is not Bernoulli? Uh, but before that, before that, what about the other side? Okay, so we saw y greater than expected value of y plus t. What about y less than expected value minus t? So it turns out the standard trick here is to instead of looking at y, you look at minus y, and then you again use the same bounding method. Okay, so it seems like a bit of a trickery, but that's what that's what happens. Yeah. Uh, what about other distributions which are not Bernoulli? Many, many, many extensions exist. This is a very, very strong research area. I mean, it's uh, still active. A lot of people keep improving these bounds. There's something called Hofding's inequality, Bennett's inequality. You can see it's gone way beyond the Russian mafia, right? The whole world is involved now. <laughs> okay, everybody's doing uh, work on this. Uh, if your random variable is bounded, then uh, the exponential concentration applies. If it's bounded as finite variance, uh, more sharp results apply, etc., etc., etc. Okay, so there's lots of lots of uh, tons of work that's been done in improving this. Okay, now here is what's more important to me. Why I I wanted to introduce concentration in uh, even your course, the first course here. I have a short lecture and describe why this is important. Is uh, when you deal with data, concentration becomes a very, very powerful uh, aid for you to think about what is happening. This is good intuition. Okay? So notice what has happened here from a very high level. right? So there's n iid random variables according to some distribution and you added up all of them. Okay? Now you might say, what if you have other functions? So generally, when you, when, you, when you look at a complicated enough statistical phenomenon, maybe, maybe you know, rainfall or you know, drought or uh, production of a crop or anything, the the actual phenomenon, the actual number, or you take the IPL score, right? For instance, whatever complicated enough statistical phenomena if you take, the actual number that you get will be a function of several underlying independent uh, random variables. You can always think of it like that. Okay, there will be so many factors. They, in the data science parlance, they call it factors. Okay, there will be so many factors, so many random variables in your phenomenon. And uh, you, the final phenomenon of interest to you will be some complicated function of all these guys. Now, what concentration tells you is this really, really powerful thing that if your function f sort of depends equally on all variables, right? So, this, this all this is very vague. I'm, I'm being vague here. If you want to study this more deeply, there's lots of deep study you can do. But notice the sum. Sum is a very clear example of one such function. The sum depends equally on every variable, right? It does not depend unduly large on any one variable. It depends equally well on all variables. So some sort of result like that must be true. So if you have a function of several independent random variables and this function depends uh, sort of equally on all of them. So, so finally, this function is what? It, it's, it sort of amalgamates or you know, it takes everything together, a lot of independent things together and finally something comes. Anytime something like that comes, you have concentration. Anytime you have a function which is which depends on a lot of factors equally, 
then you will have concentration. Concentration meaning the expected value of uh, that random variable will be very indicative of how the distribution is. The distribution is around the expected value. Now that is a good insight into data, is not it? When you collect data about an event and uh, what you want to do is to think about that particular column of data and then think about what is it a function of? What are all the factors involved that came up with this function? If it is rainfall then you are thinking of you know wind and uh, moisture content and pressure and temperature. I mean so many factors are there. What happened somewhere in the Arabian Sea a few days back? What happened somewhere in the Bay of Bengal a few days back in different areas? I mean, it is actually a function of all of that, right? The amount of rain that a particular city gets in a particular day, okay? And if, if all of these are independent, are they independent? Maybe not, I do not know. But if all of these are independent and your final number sort of depends close, I mean equally on all these independent things, it turns out the average rainfall in distribution, an average of the rainfall is, uh, is a good indicator of how the distribution is, the entire distribution concentrates around the average. So, so if you are looking at a particular data and uh, if you see that it is actually a function of several different random variables that are all independent, then you can expect it to be uh, concentrating around its average. All your average uh, expectations and all of that make a lot of sense, okay? So this is good intuition to have, okay? So uh, finally, even if all the math that we did was not crystal clear to you, it is okay, keep working on it. But this final takeaway is very, very important. Okay, because when you look at data, this is a question you have to keep asking all the time. Can I expect that this column of data is going to behave, the distribution, is it going to be close to its average or is it going to be far away? Do I need lot more samples? Do I need lot less samples? All of these uh, can be answered with this kind of intuition. Okay, thank you very much.